emphasis in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we continue with our series on prayers of old, prayers from the Old Testament. The first prayer we did was of Moses, where Moses interceded for the people. Then we did the prayer of Hannah, where Hannah responded to God's answer to her prayer with praise and thanksgiving. And today we get to King David, who says, sorry. What a thing to say for a king. But in Canada, it is so commonplace to hear the word sorry. In fact, this is a reputation, I think, that we as Canadians have with people around the world. When they think about Canadians, they always say, they say sorry. It's something that I am very comfortable with. As someone coming from South Africa, we also don't mind saying sorry. And here in Canada, when people say sorry, it just means that they are willing to get along. They, they don't want to offend people or they don't want to um, disrupt relationships, but they want to, to get along with, with people and as a society. So it's a, actually a very nice thing. But the word sorry and saying sorry can have a range of meanings. It can be deep and from the heart, or it could be just superficial. You need to know when someone is saying sorry, where they are coming from. Is this a heartfelt apology, an ask for forgiveness, or is this just a superficial sorry? You know, in Canada, someone could bump into you on the road and then not that person, but you would say sorry. In fact, both people could say sorry. The person bumping into you would say sorry, and you being bumped into would also say sorry. Both people would say sorry, 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 sorry. In fact, this could become such a problem that there was an apology act passed in Ontario. This is totally Canadian. When I was learning to drive, I was told, whenever, if you're ever in an accident, never say sorry. Because if there's a court case afterwards, that sorry of yours, that apology of yours, will be taken as an admission of guilt. And you will struggle to win that court case. Even though you, maybe you were not at fault, the fact that you admitted guilt at the scene is going to incriminate you. Now, of course, you can see what kind of issue that could have in Canada when everyone says sorry. So, the, in Ontario, the Act was passed, the Apology Act, which is a special law that says after an accident, the person that said sorry doesn't necessarily admit to guilt. So, if you say sorry after an accident in Ontario, that doesn't mean that you're admitting to guilt. It just means that you've, you are sorry that this accident happened. And uh, the lawyers can continue to argue their cases in a law, lawsuit afterwards without this hurdle of having to overcome their client admitting to guilt by saying sorry. So the Apology Act, I think, is very Canadian. I don't think there's any other country that has something like that. But um, it, it helps us to know that in Canada, when we say sorry, it could mean a range of things. When King David says sorry, he is asking forgiveness from the heart in order to restore and maintain his relationship with God. Let us read the passage. It is from 2 Samuel and we're reading from verses 24, sorry, chapter 24, verses 10 to 17, NIV version. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. 
before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad, the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come on you three years of famine in your land, or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, or three days of plague in your land? Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for His mercy is great. But do not let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated. And 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, as we come this morning to this passage, I pray that the example of David would be instructive to us. I pray that we would learn from his example, and I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. The story is about 3,000 years old, and yet it is so relevant for us. May you use this time to turn our minds and our hearts towards you, to convict us, maybe of our sin and of our need for forgiveness. And may you provide a way for us to be in a right relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now David prays his prayer and says, Lord, forgive me. Take away my guilt. I have sinned. I have done wrong. But you need to understand a bit of the backstory here. Why this king prays this prayer. The backstory is that David was king of Israel, and Israelite kings were not allowed to count all their people. This was not a universal law for all people, like stealing is always wrong, but it was specifically peculiar to Israel. Other nations had kings that exercised total control over them, and when those kings die, they join their gods as part of the pantheon in the sky. So, while they lived as kings, they were godlike. Divinity in waiting, so to speak. Israel's king was in a totally different situation. The king was a servant to the God of Israel, not a colleague. And when he dies, he dies as a human being never becoming divine. Now, kings would normally take a census from time to time so they could have a basis for taxes and for conscription. In Israel, there was a different practice. There was a voluntary temple tax. There was a voluntary military service when needed. You see, God is the real king of Israel. The appointed king, like David, is a servant of God. Now, because this structure was so different, it was very wrong of David to go and count the people like the other kings would do in their countries. David, though, chooses... Sorry. David, though... Um, sins willfully when he goes and counts the people. 
He does what is wrong. Joab, his commander-in-chief, tries to dissuade him, speaks to him. But David presses on, and it says that his word, the word of the king, overrides Joab's objections to this. So as David presses on, then the sin is committed. And David is conscience-stricken. He knows that he did wrong. And he did it on purpose. This was not just a slip-up. This wasn't just a sin that came unannounced. This was a willful sin that he knew was wrong. So the question then becomes, what should he do about that? It's a question for David, but it's a question for us too. When we sin, and especially if we sin willfully, what should we do about that? Three options come to mind. The first is to pretend it never happened. Just carry on. This I see as a, uh, the option that, we, that, that David took with, when he sinned with Bathsheba. We know that David slept with Bathsheba while she was married to Uriah the Hittite. And then David had him killed afterwards. And David continued as if nothing had happened. What he did would have been okay in other countries. Other kings could do what, as they pleased. Other kings could just take whatever woman they wanted to be their wife. They could have killed who they wanted to have killed. They had total control over their, their countries or their cities, the areas that they were governing. But not so with Israel. The king of Israel was a servant of God. The king of Israel had to obey the laws and the commandments of the God of Israel. The king of Israel was not above those commandments. And so when David did that, the prophet Nathan came to see him, to pay him a visit. And Nathan told him that story about the rich man who had lots of sheep and the poor man who only had one little lamb. And when the rich man had visitors, he took the lamb from the poor man to prepare a meal for his visitors. And David got so mad, he said, that man should die. And then Nathan turned around and he says, you are that man. You see, David tried just to continue as if nothing was wrong, as if what he did was okay, because other kings would do the same thing. But God would have none of that. And God sent his prophet to go speak to David. Well, maybe David had learned his lesson. But this time around, he doesn't take that option, pretending that nothing had happened. There's a second option that's open to him. That is to hide from God. Yes, I've done wrong. I've sinned. God has seen me. God knows but I can go hide. This is what Adam and Eve tried, of course, in the Garden of Eden. When they had sinned and eaten from the tree that they shouldn't have eaten from, God came and looked for them. He found them hiding. Hiding from God, as if anyone can hide from God. But this is the impulse, you see. When you know you've done wrong in God's sight, when you know it was willful, there's nothing for you to do. Where can you go? What can you do? So people will try and hide. That is never successful. It wasn't successful with Adam and Eve. And God spoke to them and said, why are you hiding? And it all came out. Of course, as it came out, none of them took responsibility for it. Everyone just blamed someone else. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. <laughs> Everyone seemed to, um, to ascribe their own weakness or their own sin to someone or something else. The third option that David has, he could pretend it never happened, he could hide from God, but the third option is he can confess and he can repent. 
come clean and admit what you've done. This is then, of course, what David chooses. In the New Testament, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, the temptation is not to confess, not to come clean. But if we do, God is faithful and just. God is not going to reject us. God is going to forgive us. And God is going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to have that faith in God. We need to have that trust to know that even though I've sinned willfully against Him, that I can come before Him. And as I confess, He will be faithful and just to forgive me. That is the trust, that is the faith that I can have in God's character, in who He is, and He will never change. In verse 10 of our passage, we find then that David is self-aware and he's open to the Spirit's conviction. It is when the Spirit convicts him of what he had done that he is conscience-stricken. He prays a prayer of confession. He says, I have sinned. I have acted foolishly. He takes personal responsibility He's not blaming it on this one or that one. He's not trying to justify himself and say, well, other kings do it all the time. They, they count their people whenever they want to. He doesn't do any of that. But he takes personal responsibility before God. And then he says, please take away the guilt. Please forgive the iniquity of your servant. Your servant. That's the relationship that he has with God. And that's the relationship that he wants to maintain. He wants it restored. That is why he wants the guilt taken away. That's why he wants iniquity being forgiven, so that that relationship that he has with God can be restored. A clean slate. An open two-way relationship and communication between him and God. That is what he desires, and that is what he's praying for in verse 10. That is the prayer that you and I need to pray if we are in the same situation. In verse 11 then, the next morning, God answers his prayer through Gad, his seer. That's the prophet that comes to him. This is a different situation than he had with Bathsheba, where the prophet had to come and tell him and confront him with what he did. David was first here. He preempted that. He went to God himself and prayed. But now God sends the prophet, and the prophet is going to give him three choices. In verse 12, it says that God is going to punish David. There will be a punishment for this. But he has three choices as to what it would be. Sometimes I think back to my days at school, um, when you get called into the headmaster's office, or one of the teachers would, would, would take you to discipline. Now in South Africa, of course, that time, we, we, we all got the, the cane, and so uh, you'd get in the office and, and they would say, I've, I have two canes. I have a thick one and a thin one. Which one would you like? And uh, you would try and figure out which one would be best to take. Would it be the thick one? It would be so hard. But the thin one, it really burns. So you, you'd have to try and make a decision. But sometimes it would involve you in the punishment that you would get. David is involved. Three options. Three years of famine or to flee from his foes for three months, or three days of pestilence. All three, absolutely daunting. What does David choose? David chooses the three days, because what David says, he says to fall into God's hands, rather than that of men is better. Why is that better? Because God's mercy is great. Men don't have great mercy, but God has great mercy. If you walk away from today's 
sermon this morning with this knowledge in your mind, this the sure fact that God is a merciful God and God is a God who is faithful and just and will forgive you if you ask forgiveness. If that's what you walk away with today, I would be so happy. Because this is what David knew. He knew that he could confess to God and he knew that God's mercy is great. So even though there will be punishment, there will be mercy with that. And that's what he trusted in. That's what he had faith in. He knows God's character, and he has learned to trust God. God is a God who is slow to anger, but he's rich in mercy, or rich in love. So he chooses the pestilence for three days, and God sends 70,000 men died. The destroying angel then turns to Jerusalem, but God shows mercy. Exactly what David was banking on. The Lord relented and stopped the angel. Then in verse 17, David prays again. He says, Behold, I am the one who has sinned. These other people are like sheep. What have they done wrong? Please, rather punish me and my family. You see, when David prays like this, confirming the confession that he did, confirming his personal responsibility, and opening himself to accept the punishment that God gives. Yes, Lord, you are right to punish. But punish me and my family. See, that's repentance. That's not just saying sorry. Repentance is... is, coming to God, asking for forgiveness, wanting that relationship to be restored, and opening yourself to whatever punishment God chooses to give. Zacchaeus, when he sees Jesus walking past, cries out, Jesus comes to him, goes to his house. He is forgiven, and what does he do? He says, I'm going to give back to everyone that I've stolen from. I'm going to make restitution because my repentance is real. I am not just saying sorry. David is repenting truly. Now, we discipline our kids. We have a few things that we keep in mind, of course. First of all, we want them to know that what they've done is wrong. So, whenever we want to punish We would sit down and make sure that they understand that what they've done was wrong. That's the first thing we want to know. They must know that they did wrong. Secondly, we want them to ask forgiveness. We want them to say sorry. And then thirdly, we want to hug them to restore the relationship, to let them know that we love them still, that the relationship is restored, that the slate is clean. This will not be held against them. And then fourthly, we want them to accept the punishment that they get. So whatever that may be, even if they are going to be grounded for a time, they know what they did was wrong. They understand that. They've asked for forgiveness. They were shown forgiveness. The relationship was restored. They were hugged and loved. And then they received the punishment to be grounded for a time or whatever the punishment will be to train them, to teach them so they don't do that again. This is how we teach our children, how we train them. This is how God takes care of us, our Father in heaven. Some people would look at this and say, well, the New Testament situation is different because Jesus forgives us. He died for our sins. And that's true. Jesus did die for our sins. And because of Jesus, we can have forgiveness. That is, we can have a restored relationship with God. God can give us a clean slate because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because He took his, our sins upon Him. 
we can now have this beautiful relationship, this restored relationship with God. But Jesus does more than that. Not only does He restore our relationship with God by providing forgiveness for us, He also helps us deal with the consequences of our sins. So any punishment or any consequence of our sins, Jesus can help us deal with that. Zacchaeus, what he did afterwards is he paid back the people that he stole from. And I know many people who became Christians, who came out of a, a very bad lifestyle, had to do reparations, make restitution after they became a Christian. And many times that was not easy. Many times they had to go to people and ask forgiveness for things that they had done. Sometimes they had to go back and repay monies that they had stolen or defrauded people out of. But I've heard the stories of how God helped them as they did that. How God was with them. Those people who exploded their family lives through anger or through drunkenness or through other kinds of addictions, those people had to go and try and piece back together those family relationships. And God was gracious to them. God was helping them do that. And that's what we find in Jesus Christ. Not only does He forgive our sins and clears that relationship with God and gives us a clean slate, but He also helps us now to deal with those consequences of our sins. There are two major parts to the consequences. The first major part is an eternal consequence, the biggest consequence that we have, and that's eternal death. That is, to be banished from God's presence forever. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden and from God's presence, but it was temporal. But the threat is that we be banished from God's presence for all eternity. And Jesus helps us deal with that consequence. Not only does He provide forgiveness for us and a restored relationship with God, but He deals with that consequence of our sin, which is an eternity without God. And then, secondly, temporally, here while we live on this earth, we are going to have to deal with some consequences of our sins. We're going to have to make restitution sometimes. We have to go and ask forgiveness sometimes. We have to go and try and piece together, try and patch up some relationships that we have destroyed through our sinful behavior. And when we do those things, Jesus will be with us. He will not take those away from us. There's no magic wand that gets waved when you ask forgiveness and all of a sudden all your troubles disappear. But you're restored in relationship to God. You have eternity with God waiting for you. And in this life, you have Jesus working with you side by side to face the consequences of the things that you've done. In um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 8, it says, And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as, far, as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one He loves and He chastens everyone He accepts as His Son. That's an interesting word. He chastens. Some translations say He punishes. The word in Greek uh, that is being used is the word for flogging. A whip. The uh, biblical lexicon says... The whip was not only used for correcting horses, but was the special implement of Israelite discipline, whether wielded by the father against his children, 
by the authorities against lawbreakers, or by God himself for the perfecting or purifying of his own people, as well as for the punishing of sinners. There may be some punishment for your sin, like David found out. But look at that punishment as God's discipline. It says, remember in verse 7, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as His children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So here's what I'm trying to say. God has provided forgiveness for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. That restores our relationship with God. Jesus will help us with the eternal consequences of our sin. But He will also help us temporally. So whatever punishment there may be from God, whatever discipline there may be from God, whatever chastisement or flogging there may be from God for His people, Jesus will help us with that. And that will be turned to our good for training in righteousness. Now, I'm going to wrap this up, bring us to a close, by looking at David as an example for us. The first thing we learn from David is to know our place, to know that God is king and we are not. David understood that. Secondly, to be self-aware and to be open to the Spirit's conviction. To be aware when we sin. And when we're not aware, to be open to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of the sins in our lives. Number three, to take personal responsibility for our sins. Not to try and justify ourselves, not to try and blame others for what we did, but take personal responsibility. Number four, to throw ourselves on God's mercy, because He is a merciful God. Yes, there may be some consequences. Yes, there may be some punishment, but it will not be without mercy. Number five, to accept any discipline or punishment from God's hand. You see, the discipline from the father on the child will do no good if the child doesn't accept that. If a child rebels and does not accept any discipline, there will be no growth. What is intended to train someone in righteousness will not have the desired effect. So for you and I, if we come to God and we ask forgiveness for our sins, and if there is a punishment or a consequence, we need to accept that gladly from His hand. It is often said that forgiveness is all about relationship. And that relationship is the deepest need of the human heart. This is beautifully illustrated in an old Spanish folk tale. Ernest Hemingway recounts the story about a Spanish father and a son named Paco, one of the most common nicknames in all of Spain. That's an important clue. According to the story, Paco rebels against his father's influence. Perhaps he is unwilling to follow his father's rules, preferring to define his own code for living. Maybe he doesn't want to take on the responsibilities his father asks of him or face up to the character problems and growth issues his father wants him to see. At one peak moment, the boy spews out some hateful words. He tells his dad that he doesn't need him, wants nothing to do with him, and in fact wishes he was dead. That night, Paco packs up his meager belongings, walks out the front door, slamming it behind him. 
he travels to far away Madrid, resolving to disappear forever in the big city. Although the relationship between them is now broken, Paco is never out of his father's mind. What if my son is sick or injured, his dad often thinks. What if he's fallen into dangerous company or become addicted to something that's destroying him? What if he's wasting his life in trivial pursuits and slowly dying to his own potential? What if others are using and abusing him or he slipped into a pattern of doing that to others? What if he's in trouble or alone or just missing home but he thinks he can't come back because he's done so much wrong? One day, the father can't bear the separation no longer. Leaving the family's home in the hills, he too travels a long way off to the big city of Madrid. He goes to the office of El Liberal, one of Madrid's most widely read newspapers, and he places an ad in the personal or classified sections. The ad simply reads like this. Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven. Signed, Papa. It was just before noon that Tuesday when Paco's father finally reached the center of Madrid. As he reached the Hotel Montana, the father noticed some kind of ruckus ahead. The Madrid police were there in large numbers, trying in vain to break up a huge crowd that was swarming around the hotel entrance. Suddenly, the father spots a familiar head in the midst of the throng. Paco, he cries out. The head of the boy whips around. His face full of hope. And at that very same instant, the heads of about 800 other men turned to face the father too. They came in all shapes and sizes and in a range of ages. They were all named Paco. They all saw the ad, and they all dared to hope. Father came for me, and all is forgiven. Let us pray. Father God, as we come this morning and think about you as our Heavenly Father, And we think about the many times we've done wrong, willfully at times. And how our relationship with you has been troubled by that. Lord, I pray that this morning that we would know that your love for us is never ending. That you have sent your Son so that we can be forgiven. That your only Son went to the cross so that we can live forever with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. Father God, I pray this morning that we would know that you are the Father that is standing there saying, come to me. All is forgiven. If you will come to me, our relationship will be renewed. It will be restored. There will be a clean slate. I will remove the sin that, you've, that seems so big to you now from you as far as the east is from the west. And I will think about it no more. Oh Lord, I pray. I pray that there would be people today, who would hear this message, and Lord, they would fall on their knees like David did, and repent, and ask forgiveness. I pray for myself, Lord. 
Pray that you forgive me. Pray that you renew and restore and rekindle and revitalize our relationship. And if there is to be any punishment or consequences, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help me through that. And I ask us in your holy name. Amen.